So honored. My name is Rebecca Wilson. I'm the media director at Tibet House, and um, we're just so honored to be to have Kevin Pache here tonight. Um, just want to take a little poll here. Who has never been to Tibet House? Okay, quite a few of you. Welcome. Tibet House is the cultural center for His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and we do all kinds of things from education to meditation to guest speakers to whatever. So check out our website, and we are primarily funded by our members. So are there members in the room? Can I see a hands of quite a few? Great, thank you for your membership. Um, so to moving on tonight, uh, we have Tenzin Gaelic doing the um, in interpretation for Ken Rinpoche. And he, we are so fortunate because he, also his monks are streaming, hello streaming people. We have a lot of people in India watching, both at nunneries and at Tashi Limpo. And we also have people all around the country tuning in for him, so it's very special. I'd like to introduce Laura Kozaitis, who is head of the Siddhartha School Project, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about Ken Rinpoche's involvement in education initiatives, which fits in with the um, educational secular ethics of Force for Good. So, um, where is Laura? There's Laura. Thank you, Rebecca, and I just wanted to say on behalf of Ken Rinpoche and the Siddhartha School Project and his monastery at Tashimampo in Balakupe, it is an honor to be here tonight and to be asked to speak on such an important topic. Um, I think I've known Rinpoche for about 30 years now, um, and he, uh, has exemplified at every turn uh, a commitment to education in its broadest sense. Uh, Ken Rinpoche left Ladakh where he um, was born and raised at the age of 15 about 65 years ago to walk with his father all the way to Shigatse, Tibet, about 850 miles to get his education. I think that left a profound impression on him uh, to uh, strive to get education at all costs, um, uh, that that is truly the force for good in the world. Um, I met him when I was at Smith College through the grace of uh, Bob Thurman and other um, professors who were instrumental in bringing him to the five college area where he taught Buddhist philosophy in a seminar on Tibetan art with Marilyn Reed. Uh, he arranged for me to study with the Tonka painter back in Ladakh, and when I returned, he promptly said, I have a little money from my lecturing, and I want to open a school in my village. So we helped him to open a school. That was 25 years ago. We started in a rented room, and today over uh, 380 students are served from grades nursery school through class 10. We have two graduates this year, who will be enrolling at Smith College and Bennington College. They're the first girls from Ladakh to graduate from high school here and get full scholarships. So things have come full circle. I was at the monastery in December where uh, Ken Rinpoche was asked by His Holiness the Dalai Lama to be the abbot in 2005. Uh, the first time he was asked, when was that Rinpoche, like 2000? He asked His Holiness to wait because he was starting the school. And His Holiness said, okay, but next time I need you. So in 2005, he took the position and he just 
completed an absolutely spectacular main temple hall in December. His Holiness was there for uh, one month giving teachings. His sister, Judson Pamela, said this was an absolutely perfect event um, in every way um, that it honored all of the appropriate heritage and um, beautiful traditions and at the same time welcome people from all over the world. So I would just feel very grateful tonight and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> During the 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 <laughs> Um, hello everyone. Um, today I'm uh, asked to come to Tibet House uh, to talk about uh, uh, the, the subject of the Buddhichita, the, uh, really the practices of a Buddhichita. And uh, Rebecca, who's a very good friend of mine, invited me. And I'm not sure how much I can really help to really serve the you know, purpose of the uh, discussion tonight. But uh, I'm very happy to see uh, many of you again. Um, I've um, recognized uh, some of you uh, from before. And to really so happy to see you again here. And uh, I hope we will have a good discussion. And that discussion will be beneficial to all of us. I used to uh, give lecture in my broken English. Uh, this is the first time I really relayed on translator. So we, let's see how it goes. <laughs> and I requested uh, Rinpoche to really uh, teach in English, but... Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> so first we start with a prayer. <clears throat> Gangi took singers on the tower than the pump, which is done between the tons of the Godam de la Chasalo. Tadam Chigadus Chigi Japsunga, which is a given than the tendency to do a Talwit in the Isin Nula, the Jang Patari Samjing, the Eka Jingla and Amgil Lord under, so the Samnish Jitin Chawabu, Bumba Charvaj into Tokyo, and Yinzang with the Nimble Lambert Goes, the Sunjada. That ガチンボだね、トンチンボです。いじんのらだね。人間にパターンで、天で太郎が言ったんじょろちゅうさんを見る人物とばで、誰さんじきんせ。もうとまめのたでぶじね、ただ、まずなんばぎちね、とまやし
Young Mong Banit in their Tabat and Jedaka Kalaka for years. Karede Kalaka Boy no Karenza, the Gidu but the Kalaka Boy, Judas and the Dizagorova. Dizagoza, two numbers of Jesus, and then a Chinto Paru de Chimaju Torte, then eh? Kaza the Malam Timan was Tamjaz, they do have the Kalaka of Sansan, the young Yepas, Tarizamji, Yaka, Yaka, the young skin yet, the Kalaka for it. They in a day, so but they are young, Jurim Bumepe, Namsang, Namsang, Jurjugi, Namkelog, Namjil, Namkelog, and then Yaka Jil and Namkelog, and then this, the idea, Yaka, what I'm the name. Talagia and Jorachu, Tizoka, Yoti, Samlo Yatan, and then they miss a dig and so say at I Tonchamusi, Kajan, they do a lay, and they are Kazata, so say a teacher was Dagan. Long Jonchi, eh, Mitsi dia, Yata, Tondan Damaji Choker, yes, and they soon are the same. So, um, <coughs> Uh, as you would know, the Lama Tsongkhapa, in his uh, the abbreviated Lamrim text, uh, he started talking about the really preciousness of the human uh, life. And he talks about the eight leisures, the uh, ten endowments, and so on. And uh, Rinpoche was reciting from that text and really leading us to really start thinking how rare it is for us to attend this most wonderful and precious human birth. And uh, Lama Tsongkhapa really sums up in this beautiful uh, text. Uh, first, he talks about you know, how wonderful it is to attend the human birth. And then he goes on to look at how rare to attend such precious human life. And then the thirdly, he started talking about uh, how um, kind of uh, uh, very um, certainly uh, one can lose that precious uh, human birth because our life is so fragile. Um, if you read the Lamrim uh, and abbreviated the Lamrim, you will see that in the right at the beginning of the text. And so um, it's wonderful that we attend such wonderful human birth. And when we talk about where, why it's so rare and precious that we have this wonderful human birth, it's because you have to look at the causes. The causes that really produce the most precious human birth, uh, you know, with the aid, leisures, and endowment. One has to engage in the practice of uh, um, a discipline. Uh, you really have to, you know, observe a lot of uh, uh, the uh, vows and commitment and so on. And you also have to engage in the practices of some of the six perfections, including the uh, perfections of a generosity, really to cultivate that kind of causes, the seed. And you also have to engage in a very kind of uh, proper and intense prayer and the commitment and the pledge and so on. With the combination of much more, not just limiting to this, but you know, combination of all these actions that really produces this wonderful human birth and which we are right now enjoying it. And when we have to realize that to really um, treasure, to uh, really see what a ray, you know, like a, a gift we had, endowment we had. And then what do we have to do is uh, knowing that this wonderful gift is also very fragile and the death is kind of, uh, um, it's always there and we are so um, vulnerable uh, to the, you know, end of our life because of the, the fragility of uh, our um, physical form, so on. And so what does lead us to think is we make this life meaningful. Really do not waste it, really use it in a kind of uh, most appropriate way to attain an even better life. And we have that ability and the capacity. And um, when we referred, also the Lama Tsongkhapa referred in the Lamnum text, was that uh, this precious human life is like a wish-fulfilling uh, jewel, a germ. And that's because it really enables us to open much greater opportunities for much you know, better lives and so on, for ourselves and for others. 
Therefore, the essence of this really advice is first, think how wonderful it is that we have this wonderful opportunity. Second, don't waste it. A third, be careful, it's so fragile and do not kind of waste even a minute of your life and treasure it and use it for the good causes. So, as Lama Tsongkhapa advised, we have to make the most out of this life, make it meaningful. And to do that, we don't have so much time tonight. And we have to really utilize it properly. And for that purpose, tonight, we're going to talk about the practices of a bodhicitta. And uh, the practices of the bodhicitta is really there to improve and enhance our ability, capacity to help ourselves and others. And tonight, um, generally speaking, when we talk about the practice of bodhicitta, there are two ways of really developing bodhicitta, as you, most of you would know. And uh, um, one is the seven causes and effect. And the second approach is really the exchange of self with others. And so these are the uh, two major, really, the uh, practices or the approaches of uh, generating bodhicitta. And tonight, I wanted to focus on, uh, we will um, go over the both approaches. But in particular, I wanted to talk about the uh, exchange of self with others. Um, so, the ultimate goal uh, of our practice is to attain full enlightenment, to really attain Buddhahood. And to do that, there are two approaches for um, attaining Buddhahood, as I mentioned before. The first one is the seven causes and effect. The second approach is exchange of self with others. And so the first one, the uh, seven causes and effect, 
I wanted to go over what are these seven causes and the effect or the result. And so we would say we wanted to attain uh, Buddhahood or enlightenment. So that's the ultimate goal. And so you have to start investigating what are the causes which really lead you to uh, attain uh, full enlightenment. And uh, so the uh, causes are that uh, um, bodhicitta is really the causes of attaining enlightenment uh, fully. Um, and so this bodhicitta is really uh, developed through the practices of uh, extraordinary um, intention. Um, the laksam, the extraordinary intention. And this extraordinary intention uh, is generated uh, by the practice of a great compassion. So we're, inv we're investigating all these causes. And the com compassion is, uh, arises out of um, really loving kindness uh, mm, and very intense kind of loving kindness toward the sentient beings. And how do you really generate this most loving kindness is through the uh, strong commitment of uh, repaying one's kindness to all the mother sentient beings. Once you realize that all the mother sentient beings um, have been very kind to you, and then through really understanding this kindness, you wanted to repay back. And so this repayment of uh, kindness um, is the, uh, one approach. And so how do we generate this uh, um, recognizing this amazing kindness is really realizing how kind they have been to us. And so to really understand how kind they <clears throat> have been to us, we have to recognize that all sentient beings really, in fact, have been our mothers in our previous lives. And uh, so this, uh, like a seven in together, and the, uh, one of the first six is really the causes. Mm, and then the, uh, this uh, final one is the result. And so um, if you look at it, um, like uh, what we have been looking is from kind of uh, result toward the very first causes. But if you go the other ways, first you recognize all sentient beings as your mother. That's the first step. Second, really remembering their kindness. A third one is really intention to repay their kindness. Fourth one is then generating this very powerful, extraordinary loving kindness. And then the fifth one is uh, generating great compassion to all sentient beings. And the once you have the great compassion, then you have this uh, mm, extraordinary uh, intention to really uh, help them attain enlightenment. And through that, then you have generated bodhicitta. And this bodhicitta resulted in full enlightenment. And so these are the um, seven causes and, causes and effect of a practice of bodhicitta. And uh, then the second one is uh, the exchange of self with others. And these two traditions, um, the one really come from the, we usually call the extensive activities of a Buddha coming through Buddha Shagimoni, then Maitreya Buddha, and Asanga, and so on, and one lineage. And the other is coming through Buddha, and then uh, Nagarjuna, and uh, um, the Shantideva, and so on, so through that lineage. And uh, tonight, uh, we will maybe uh, focus on the practice of uh, exchange of uh, self with others. That's coming through the um, Shantideva's tradition. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> And the number of the genus, you are a Toma Yom, and a Toma Toma member and a Tate Buddha Tichi on the Nesca or the Esther song. That Toma member can't do girls in it, and they are so so and ya, Skewa Chirod, than the Amajigara, Amadegi, and that some member Skewa Mangbuna, Manzo Amamuche or the Esther. Tangan to Skewa Chiglin to somebody, Amachikuro, Skewa Yalinsuna, Amagiaguro, that do the art, do you are the. Stone, Mrs. Agamir, Kazama, 
ဒီကစားအကန်စာစင်ချင်းချင်းကစံရံငမမာချေပါတန်အမမာချေပါတန်ငေကစားတဲ့အာမဘူးတီအားတူတန်တောငံစုကြီးနဲ့စကြောတော
if one follows the concept of a creator, and then at the beginning of your life in the samsara, start with the creator's um, project, the day or the life the creator created you, then you started your life in the samsara. But for the Buddhists, because we have been here for countless lifetimes, and this very fact actually differentiates us, our notion of the life not being created by the uh, creator, but rather through the uh, causes of uh, affliction and its subsequent um, karma. And this logic really again assert the view that we have been in samsara for um, countless times, lifetimes, countless lifetimes. And these countless lifetimes, we have been relying on countless sentient beings. And these sentient beings, in fact, really have been our mothers at some stage of our lifetime. And Rinpoche also pointed out, sometimes even more than once, they have been taking care of us in this really difficult journey in the samsara. Because of that, we build this compassion toward the sentient beings. Right. <laughs> That <laughs> Timade <laughs> and they didn't have to suffer the joy. So, um, as we really discuss about this uh, samsara and uh, affliction and the karma and so on, um, one thing really important that we realized here is the continuation of uh, birth in samsara. And so, that continuation is not a physical, as you would know. Uh, when we die, we leave our body behind. But then we, as a, a consciousness, uh, continues to really uh, travel uh, in the samsara. <clears throat> that consciousness, really um, led by the karma and affliction and so on, keeps us in samsara. And so um, when we try to investigate what causes us uh, to be in the samsara, and, and what causes our consciousness really continue the journey or the cycle in samsara, um, it's the uh, ignorance, this uh, um, mistaken view. And that really creates uh, affliction. And that affliction you know, uh, creates negative or sometimes positive karmas. 
And that really kind of creates the vicious cycle in samsara. And then Lama Tsongkhapa, as also Rinpoche mentioned before, now in this lifetime, we have this amazing um, power and opportunity really to cut that uh, tie to samsara through practices. And then the question that we ask ourselves, how do we really cut the knot? You know, that's what bind us to samsara and attain uh, enlightenment. And uh, that um, is uh, really first of all to recognize the nature of our mind or the consciousness. And uh, we know that the nature of our mind has this element of a clear light uh, capacity or the characters. Our mind being the, really the essence of a clear light without any stands. So the real nature of that mind is really totally um, free from any um, stands. But then uh, that stand is uh, right now uh, being attached to our um, uh, mind through the um, ignorance and the mistaken views, the grasping mind. And so how do we really uh, polish our mind? This is what exactly the purpose of the Dharma practice is, polishing that mind through the hearing teachings, the practices, and uh, contemplating on teachings. So that's the act, which really actually just the work of the uh, cleansing. And so the stain, which is not the nature of the mind, but it's the kind of uh, um, um, in outside, really, the um, association of the mind. It's not the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind is being clear light in nature. And we can remove that stain through the uh, practices of the teachings. And so one shouldn't really, first of all, consider that our mind itself being the polluted or the nature being the affliction, afflictiveness. But rather the, mind, the nature of the mind being so um, clear light like, a totally absence of any stain. And that stain is uh, uh, temporary. It can be removed. That stain is removable. With the you know, practices of teaching, we can remove that. And when you realize that, then you can see the possibility of an uh, end to the samsara. You can see there is a possibility uh, to the end to our sufferings, to ours and that of sentient beings. And when you realize that, then you also realize that this is the best time to do it. This is the best time to remove that stains and to really polish our mind and bring out the uh, clear light of nature. Because at the beginning of the teaching, we talked about how rare that we have this most wonderful human birth and how powerful the human uh, in a birth it is. What are the um, possibles? The possibility is amazing. And so this is the best time to really clean that stain. No. Marche but the Yapuji Kazamakona machine, then Jandayana Kalakapur. Kochik shares on it, then the tin jump and tins of the dear Lalawe or is it? And that they had the Kaza Yasa Jewel and Lula, and the Marche then tin jump at them. They tin jump at the Lanier, that Kaza Tintan Kaza Tin Jam and Tintan Cabrachan Zingier. Tinder Kambadina lay at the Mandu Ruja taught to the other Sinjangi Kadinde, Sosolea, Togo Tamsu Yung, the Sinjangi Kandidate, that Sinjang men and Mandu Chaji Amido, Sinjangi Katin Latene, they are Kangangas or Yungi or that. So Sinjangi Katin Latene, they are Tintam, Sinjangi Katin Latene, and Mandu Mizidi Kazataya, Kaza, Mizidi Tondam Bajetu Giori, Sinjangi Katin Latene, and Mandu Yai, Diba Migio Kambaya, 
पाँव थूक गया मेरे पास जो थूक गया अरे समझेंगे कठिन लगता है ना सौ साग गया अरे सुनो संगे कहाँ समझेंगे कठिन लगता है ना गंगा या है मैं तो कहाँ है जेना चेतु की तो आते हैं समझेंगे कुछ ना देश आना तो जिस सुनी तो जो कहाँ कहाँ ज्ञावा नाम कहाँ कहाँ समझा नाम तो ज्ञावा ले संगे चुटु ज्ञावा ले यार लोग कुछ समझे मिंज चीची Kata kadin cipari dia senjawa aku baca gitu senjangan cuma kari dia dijual. Jadi aku mangsa itu senjangan gitu so so saya ada senjangan gitu so ada dibaca jangan ada senjangan itu so yang gitu sanggih aku kanga gitu jangan jual senjangan gitu senjangan itu kita guna orang. Jadi senjangan itu kita kadin cuma yang pada kongsi guna orang. Macam apa? Ama macam apa kan ada? Di dalam angkut dah senyam juga ni di samping itu senjangan. Di de. Dah senyam juga ni sama. Kita mengadu. Kau dah macam apa juga kerja macam tu juga. Tanda dia la, ama macam juga tu. Mai me, tanda tanda dia la, ama cerita ni cerita la. Kau lagi di show, show aku masih dia la. Oh dia, asal asal. So, as you can see, really true practice Buddha cerita, especially if we follow that seven causes and effect, one of the most important concept that first we have to um, get right is the uh, concept of uh, recognizing all sentient beings, you know, uh, being your mother. So based on that uh, foundation, then you build the rest of the um, approaches. Um, so th and it, it is not easy really to recognize that all sentient beings uh, have been your mother. It's not easy to really um, grasp that uh, concept, but you really have to study and develop that concept in order to practice the subsequent you know, um, uh, issues and so on. So that's the, um, the most important character in the seven causes and um, affect mind training. Then if we follow the Shantideva's approach, the uh, mind training, that of exchange of self with others, in that, uh, uh, Shantideva also talks about uh, uh, the kindness of sentient beings. And uh, so there is a different, little bit of difference between the uh, um, mother sentient beings being the most kind. Um, in the uh, seven, mind, uh, seven cause and uh, effect mind training, the important element is recognizing that all sentient beings have been your mother. Whereas in Shantideva, uh, the emphasis is on the recognizing the kindness of the sentient beings. Sometimes they say um, this uh, recognizing kindness in a unique way. Why? Because Shantideva really talks about the kindness regardless of uh, your relationship to all sentient beings. But that amazing kindness that every sentient being uh, grant to us is the key thing for our practice of a bodhicitta. According to Shantideva, um, that every uh, good result that we enjoy is primarily derived from the kindness of the other sentient beings. Um, Rinpoche uh, used to give us an example of the uh, daily food that we enjoy. It's in fact really produced by another sentient beings. The jobs that we go and the income that we bring is actually Another sentient being is granting this to us. And uh, through their kindness, we're enjoying this. And uh, um, so even um, the good uh, teachings that we enjoy, um, the uh, good kind of uh, meanings of life that we uh, um, understand, is in fact uh, through the kindness of other sentient beings uh, granting to us, let's say, the precious knowledge that we I really enjoy. Also, in fact, coming from the other sentient beings. And uh, um, through that kind of uh, wonderful virtuous teachings and knowledges that we gain from other sentient beings, we engage in the practices of a virtuous deed. And this really enables us a further enjoyment of the good fruit. Again, this is coming from um, other sentient beings. And this is how we really think about uh, all the wonderful uh, the uh, fruit that we enjoy is in fact uh, granted to us from another sentient being. And through this understanding, we develop this importance of the 
kindness of other sentient beings, regardless of they have been our mother or not. And this is also the line Shantideva approaches, and he also mentions that uh, the attainment of the full enlightenment is really derived through the kindness of the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and the sentient beings. The, our kind of uh, good um, fortune for attaining enlightenment really depends on both the Buddhas as well as the sentient beings. Or from that point of view, the kindness the both the Buddhas as well as the sentient beings rendering to us, there's no differences. And because of that, why should we only uh, respect and care about the Buddhas and not really uh, caring about the sentient beings? There's no logic. We should care for the sentient beings as much as the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. For their kindness, for our enlightenment, there's no differences. So that's how we build this logic. Marjitinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinjinj
that all sentient beings, including ourselves, desire for happiness. From that point of view, we all have the same desire. For that makes us equal. We all desire for happiness. Number one point. The number two that a reason he gave us is that all sentient beings do not desire suffering. Again, you know, we are all equal from that kind of um, approach. And then um, you have to uh, develop that both the enemies and the friends, you know, uh, you can really think them as uh, equal. Why being equal is uh, the some sentient beings are very kind to us this lifetime. Whereas in the next lifetime, they can be very hostile to us. The sentient beings that we consider as an enemy for this lifetime, they have been maybe friends and our mothers in the past. So the, the equal amount, the way they treat to us is almost equal, sometimes nice, sometimes not so nice. From this kind of uh, um, really attitude, you cultivate this kind of uh, same level or the leveled attitude to all the sentient beings. And so before we actually do the exchange of self with others, uh, Rinpoche was saying it's very important first to really equalize, uh, create equanimity of attitude to all the sentient beings. Do not have a, a leave any biased feeling. Uh, you really generate this amazing equanimity this attitude of every sentient being being the kind of a same. And uh, by thinking these reasons, once you really become more um, leveled uh, in terms of your attitude toward the sentient beings, so then you practice the next step. Kawangamane, <laughs> yeah, So these reasons that Shandideva provide us is a very powerful tool overcoming our um, attachment as well as the hatred towards sentient beings. In fact, it's really a great way of uh, um, elimin eliminating the uh, bias attitude. And so before um, the Rinpoche mentioned that uh, uh, we cannot really destroy all our enemies, but we can only destroy our hatred. Once we're able to destroy that hatred toward all sentient beings, we have destroyed all the enemies. We cannot really possess and be attached to all <coughs> sentient beings. But only when we got rid of our attachment to sentient beings, that really also destroys our clinging uh, to sentient being as a free us from pain, um, and so on. So here, mm, what Shandideva is doing is uh, um, reducing your attachment by practicing these reasons, um, reducing your uh, anger and the hatred, uh, and so creating this really um, equalized um, attitude, uh, freeing us from attachment and uh, anger. That's what it you know, actually is doing. And uh, creating this kind of uh, uh, equal um, and unbiased attitude to all sentient beings. So these are the you know, main purpose of doing that. And so again, Rinpoche uh, emphasized, um, when we have a hostile attitude 
toward sentient being. How do we overcome that? And Rinpoche says, start thinking about、uh, this particular individual, although he or she, you know, seem to us、uh, unfriendly and unhelpful and in fact harmful at this very、right、moment. But then think about、uh, in our previous lifetime or maybe another time, this very person、uh, have been caring for us because we took a number of lives, birth, and so on. And thinking that very person seems like、uh, right now we see it as very harmful, but in our previous lifetime, he or she might have been our mother and taking care of us, saving our life. When you are able to develop that attitude, it will help you to really calm down and、uh, overcome that uh, intense uh, hatred and anger toward that、um, sentient beings.、Um, in some ways, when you have a very strong attachment. To a sentient being, and that causes a pain to us, and then start thinking that very, you know, strongly、um, attached person that we our mind attached person has been a very harmful and hostile someone you really do not want to be with in our previous lifetime or an, at another、uh, time, and when you really contemplate on such kind of experience and events, this will reduce our intense. Um, hatred toward that、uh, sentient beings, and practicing these two, really uh, contemplations, uh, help us create an unbiased attitude,、uh, and kind of leveled attitude toward all sentient beings, thinking that they are all、uh, very kind to me, and so this is how we really practice that. That 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 the Daniel Parmas me or what? 라니엔파마순당한쪽에두고있잖아파전을여부설지어라와라니엔파마순대파전을여만한쪽에쌤게야쏘자가래서소당은뭐한대하고있고다이나다데한쪽에다이그쪽민지야다지금두지자두자를통계로코다이파전을여나미드소당쏘지겠다는코다랑통계로와코다말로와코에옹옹시바강가에코년들로와나대강은지난한쪽에야지지금소설이야년년두인바대소리지자기지경계로와다가대거지대야지지라게가자니인바대인네그럼파전을여나그니엔는이쪽으로니엔달라긴다니엔드교야대디규규주기도하자저는그샘게딱자소자게대그땡기몬사톰바땡기어르고니다대그다인바그다르게경계를대기어마다니엔드교교도교리니엔경달라긴규주기어르와안저간다당간리샘편에미당봉안저야수술하는야대미치두손에다문어시기어머니와다문어마시들삼바야다가서두그여조타다두디전에하루에간지가자라와갈래야지금어쩌지대중야대가가자가자시야내내야대삼당예로오지내내지기야주마대양께두손에야바지라가보지는가진대간소에내가자전에기보지용서한세양대중에대대대대대야대대중에갈래갈래대대그대중수술년도교를마터지기그때당번에는그완전히인제그때아마니키드스케이어말로와다가는지는다양그아마니키드스케이어만완전히다스케이어말로와완전히쌤기소해자리자산쌤기다섯명콜라이귤어당겨와서다다들이년도귤두개년다들귤용귤어와다당연히발마숨대야귤두개와서다그날니도와서한가자다코나디귤어맵지나디지어라다디년디귤어나안좋아하고있기도하고안데채가자다채토기안좋기야다소주배통나미대바기본미바고나야쌤네기본미바가지나배찍지어댄댄다지어코망바야갈래갈래양귤귤잔다지래댄코양안좋뭐지차도삼바양코통삼바양디귤두아다유마양코양안좋예야수술조부차도삼아코양면에메메타메페지설드기도당부야그양수조한다스탄이야지금코통도삼바구도삼바는비싼면이제당당제낭당제낭당기본메페지용결로야양코야수술직직양직파수직직육인장다지에대한코조부차도양코면에메타메페지양수수술치수가마한아치정면상양코메페지로라양대용기도두개야자상대연습부터다당연습한대백일수술로게다자면서파전투에주비와말해서는두개야되네당연히집어야다고는당연히발마
Da jand, chipa ta dan da kar zeta da dengen zoya dengen da dai zoya mane da chola dama de ya me pasu yen ge chola ya jamba de kar ne ya chipa ra ta ho re sta. So um, having used these powerful meditations, overcoming the hatred by thinking the kindness, overcoming the attachment by thinking the harms that the sentient beings had done to us. We create this leveled, unbiased attitude. And if we, and that's uh, the first kind of uh, um, more uh, common practices of uh, generating unbiased attitude towards sentient beings. And then the next practice is a little bit more profound, um, but also is uh, more powerful in meditation. It's uh, this like a, a attitude of uh, friends, um, enemies, or the impartial or the uh, strangers. These all attitude that we hold towards the sentient beings are actually created by our mind. And the Madhyamakas, they mentioned this mentally designated or labeled. Um, if you really uh, meditate carefully, think deeply, this notion of a friends, uh, enemies, or you know, the strangers are more of our own mental creation uh, than them being, being there externally um, or intrinsically exist. Uh, I give you one example. Um, if the person you see as a friend as you know, inherently exist, then that person should be friends of all other sentient beings. You all should see that as a person, unanimously, without any kind of uh, differences of feeling, right? But that is not the case. If the person that you see as an uh, enemy, it also should be the enemy of entire um, sentient beings, if they actually come as an independent object. So what do we really see here in this meditation is we are really seeing the delusions. Uh, you know, the things that we see are not objective. They're not kind of independently exist, but rather through um, dependent on our mental conception. And our mental conception is uh, generated through you know, certain causes of steps. Um, through different feelings, through different experiences and uh, incidences. Um, I can also um, go further to say that uh, our attitude to what a particular person also changes through our relationship. Um, for example, the, um, some of the enemies uh, sometimes later changed into our friends. The friends also in this very lifetime changes to enemy. And it, you can see they are so kind of changeable. And this really established the reason that these enemies, the strangers, the friends, are not really independently exist. They are not exist objectively, but rather through our subjective mental um, uh, concept. And knowing this will really uh, overcome our intense um, feelings toward these um, friends. And then in this kind of next approach is that we have to recognize that the attitude of friends, um, strangers, the um, foes, the animals, so on, are really generated by our subjective mind through you know, uh, different factors and instances. And therefore, this really uh, attitude is a not independent or a kind of absolute but rather conditioned by our experiences and the feelings. And this really uh, strongly helps us to destroy this strong belief that this is enemy. Because saying this enemy is actually created by much of our experiences and contact and so on. And when you meditate on that, and then it eases you, it softens your this strong hatred uh, toward a person, or sometimes a very intense attachment to a person, saying, actually, the person is not really there as I think it is, but rather accumulated through a lot of factors, including experiences and the contact and conditions, and so on. We pretty much created that, foes and friends. And so that is the purpose of really, um, for this meditation, understanding this uh, mental kind of uh, labeling and the designation 
um, understanding that how this works, um, Rinpoche used example of uh, you know how do we make a friends? How do we build this friends if you have a very strong clinging um, to an individual, strong attachment? Start thinking about how you first met the person. Think about what is the first conversation you ever had with that person. Then how that you know, conversation lead to a closer relationship. What conversation, contact, and experiences really hook you up to that person. And if you really very carefully analyze that, then you would realize these are all creation. These you know, like intense relationships, a product of your number of steps. And through that, experiencing different emotion at a different level of your contact. And then at some point in your life saying, my friend, I cannot do without having that person. But then if you go back to the very beginning of that relationship, and then if you step one more further, that person wasn't in your mind, then you created it. But if that person independently exists, you do not need to go through all this work. It should be there forever, but that's not the case. So that's how we really cultivate this uh, um, understanding of uh, friends and for all this attitude being created by our mind, by a very subjective mind. Yamba, <laughs> So we move to the next uh, meditation on this exchange of self with others. Once we realized that all the kind of a biased uh, attitude toward the sentient beings are created by our subjective mind, then we started seeing now we really have to exchange, we have to change that attitude. And uh, in the next step of the exchange of the self with others meditation, we actually do the exchange. And so before you really exchange uh, your um, cherishing thought with the cherishing thought of other sentient beings, in the uh, mind training um, text, it talks about you have to follow a true meditation. The first meditation is the fault, the problem of a self-cherishing thought. The second is the um, qualities and the benefit of uh, the uh, cherishing others thought, or the thought of cherishing others. So you have to meditate on these two. Um, as uh, Penchen Lama, the uh, Penchen Losan Chikya mentioned in the uh, Guru Yoga text, 
that the self-cherishing thought is the sources of all the troubles and the misfortunes in our life. Um, he made it a very clear uh, statement in that um, meditation text. Um, this is why, because now we are talking about the um, fault of a, a self-cherishing thought. Um, the self-cherishing thought is really the biggest problem that we have in our mind and in our life. And this is because uh, <coughs> through this self-cherishing thought, we engage in a lot of negative deeds. We harm a lot of people. We cause pains to many other sentient beings. Uh, we cause pains to ourselves. And because of that, we also experience a lot of misfortunes um, through the self-cherishing thought and its subsequent actions. We experience uh, illness, uh, sufferings, um, I can say, the, you know, the sufferings of the four element, the natural disasters and so on, uh, the, in the harms that we um, get from the uh, humans and the non-humans and uh, um, all these you know, different sentient beings that um, uh, it seems like they're giving us a suffering, but it's actually the product of self-cherishing thought. Um, also including the you know, uh, bite from the mosquitoes is also actually um, you can say created by our self-cherishing thought. Why? Because we have engaged in negative deeds in the past for cherishing ourselves. As a result, we experience this karma, the instant karma now. And so I can tell you countless things that the self-cherishing thought you know, bring uh, to us. And so in essence, as Penchilama mentioned, that all the negative experiences that we go through are the product of uh, our self-cherishing thought. So that's the kind of essential teaching. All right. And then, I'll just say the thing, right? And that's the thing is good. The thing is good. Because that's been a... Me... Nang Panzu Chupa Shia Tegi. Me Tegi is good. My name is so drag is good. My name is good. Karg is good. And then that's the thing is good. All right. Meeting a sort of goal like Gupaj and Gupaj, the Gupaj are the young, Kaza de Koge, Skin, Digi, Marie, the Coach Girl Marez, Nazi Zingish Kanjas, and Mingi are so sort of the Kazapena Nasa Joanna, then so picky down down the Zogan, Napa Kaba Marez, Nazi Zingi, the Jenny, Chinin Jenny, Lamina Jason, the Penna, Nazi Zin, so sort of cheaper than the Jandy Sorte. So, the Meto you moon the lesson to Tagir Mare, you know, down there, Kansa de Kion, the Tag Mares, and you moon down there, Kansa de Kion Mares, the Kansa de Karizan, spending under this night, so soon I ya, so so long, Rama Yamare, so so long, my carriage, so so long, same you want the one somewhere, same get on, same you jam on the chair, same day, I'm going around me, but same day, you moon get on the chair, you moon get on the chair, some of you are. Yeah, <laughs> Nebazon, 
Ade jetaki kote jira dupo di chi na sa dindi yongi do itate jetaki de ko cham se che di atuk che onu tu de ade che a yo mare sa ro che da nyomung dan nyomung da zuri nyomung de la dasta ge mare nyomung dan de wa kansa de la dasta ge mare es so um as i mentioned that there are so many um problems that we experience in this lifetime is actually a result of our self-cherishing thought. Why? Because we had this kind of a self-cherishing thought uh, for a number of our lifetimes. And this self-cherishing thought wanted you to do things, say, because I wanted to protect myself, I wanted to be really self-centered. Because of that, you're really harming other sentient beings. Uh, you're um, you know, killing other sentient beings because you wanted to protect yourself or you wanted to um, gain things for yourself. And this self-cherishing thought really uh, causing you to harm other sentient beings. And the self-cherishing thought engaging, you know, forcing you to engage in negative deeds. And all these results are now ripened, ripened and experiencing in this lifetime. So that's the connection between self-cherishing thought and why are you experiencing uh, suffering in this lifetime? And because of that, in the 400 verses of a Matiyamaka text by Aryadeva, the Umishib Gyeva, the Papalarva, Papalarva, the, uh, yes, 400 verses of uh, Matiyamaka uh, text by Aryadeva, and he quoted a sutra um, and saying that uh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas do not blame the sentient beings for their mistake but they really blame to the afflictions and uh, um, so on. And therefore, the Buddhas do not hate sentient beings who engage in misdeed, but rather they really see that misdeed is caused by the affliction. So they go after the affliction rather than the agent who is you know, controlled by that affliction. And the Rinpoche is saying this is so true. When we sees the other people are getting angry and uh, harming us. We shouldn't get angry at that person, but we should go a little bit deeper and go beyond that person, which is rather like agent, and say, what controls that uh, person, and which is the affliction? And so when you see that individual is controlled by his or her affliction, and then you see the, who is the real kind of uh, um, causes of that trouble. And a uh, lot of people who are getting angry, and going through frustration, and uh, causing harm to others, they seem they didn't have a control over their life. They are being controlled by their affliction. And when someone is not really entirely um, in control and in charge of their life, but rather under the influence um, of affliction, that they really do not want it to experience, then that person really, really become a kind of a, a subject of your compassion rather than uh, your anger. So when someone's really going through emotional disturbances, um, you have to see that person is under the influence of affliction and that they need help. They need really help to free themselves from that suffering rather than really going after them and causing further um, uh, suffering. And uh, this is how at least as a practitioner have to develop that attitude to the sentient beings. And um, that's why the Buddha Shakyamunis and the Buddha Chittas, uh, Bodhisattvas, they have a compassion to us. Why? Because we are under the influence of affliction. As a result, we engage in a lot of negative deeds. That kind of uh, causes us more misfortune because we have to experience the result of that negative deed. And because of that, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have a compassion to us. And we can use the same logic to other sentient beings. You shouldn't really get angry at an you know, angry person. Uh, because you should see that a person has no control almost. They experience this pain um, caused by affliction. That's where their anger is coming out. If you think that way, it will also help to improve your relationship, uh, to really improve your understanding about the need of other sentient beings. No. Mm. 
Um, so, in essence, um, our mind, um, which really kind of experiences affliction, and this affliction leads us to engage in negative deeds. As a result, we experience negative karma. So that's the kind of entirety of the, um, how the you know, um, negative experience that we go through. And uh, one of the most important thing that we have to realize here is that uh, our afflictions are really caused by the self-cherishing thought. That I wanted to do this, I wanted to engage this, I want that to be mine. And that self-cherishing thought really produces the affliction. And that in turn translates into kind of action and uh, we are experiencing illness and so on. So in the, uh, some of the sutras saying, that uh, uh, all the experiences, such as illness, the harm from the hunger ghost or the ghost, um, the natural disaster and so on, are caused by our self-cherishing thought. What it really means is that the self-cherishing thought, you know, which drives that affliction, that really uh, forces you to take action, the negative action. And that action causes the negative karma and that you're experiencing now. So all, that's where we say all the negative experiences that we go through are caused by our self-cherishing thought in previous lifetime. So we are kind of for now uh, experiencing that result rather than that another sentient being is harming to us. So we have to change that uh, attitude here. And Rinpoche is saying when I uh, talk about this, you shouldn't just listen that as a story, but really examine um, first you hear um, what we discussed tonight, and then really start analyzing whether this is the case or not, and doing your own 
analytical meditation. Once you really come to a conclusion, then what do you do? The most important part, transforming your mind. Here, transforming is that uh, now you see through the self-cherishing thought, you are engaging in anger, hatred, and so on. That produces you know, um, suffering. So you change these kind of angers, um, uh, negative thought, uh, and you really generate uh, compassion, loving kindness. And uh, when you really practice loving kindness and compassion to all sentient beings, by thinking how kind they are to you, by thinking how you know, suffering that they go through without any choices, but rather under the influence of negative um, affliction, by thinking that you generate compassion to all of the sentient beings. And when you're able to really do that, um, ultimately, you are the one who really gain most out of these practices. Why you get better sleep, you can soft your mind, this hatred, this intense kind of negative you know, attitude and emotions towards sentient beings by changing that you know, intense uh, pressure into kind of most uh, soft, gentle, this loving kindness in you. You are the one ultimately getting the result out of these practices. And once you have a compassion, and a loving kindness to sentient beings, you get a better sleep, you also taste the food a little bit better. And otherwise, you go through a lot of sleepless you know, nights if you still hold that grudge at sentient beings. And so Shantideva also mentioned in the, um, the practices of bodhisattvas, the way of bodhisattvas in the, uh, one of the chapter on patience. And he said, you cannot overcome all the sentient beings, the external sentient beings, because they're countless and it's impossible to do that. But once you overcome your anger, it equals like a overcoming all your sentient beings. Once you got rid of the anger toward all the sentient beings, then you all also got rid of all the enemies. As a result, that you're the one who really enjoy this life. And so that's what uh, we have to think about it when we practice this. That don't do it, don't Some genes that so there are nang mi mi tumba, so so na kipo me pa. And the muli na ya nyota mungbo ya, the muli na ka 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 da nyota mung ka 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 ya uganga to tanda digis kyon le, rang jinjin kyon le, rang jinjin kyon le ya de tigla ya ne the muli mi tumba yonge, rang jinjin kyon le nang mi mi tumba yonge, rang jinjin kyon da. So in short, um, if we look at all the troubles, the sufferings that we go through, our family members go through, all the really sufferings that the sentient beings experience, and all the troubles that we see in this world right now, they are really produced by this self-cherishing thought. And once we're able to overcome the self-cherishing thought, this problem will also be resolved. And so this is how bad the self-cherishing thought is. That self-cherishing the map is zero. That is wrong. 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 That is Yonde, <laughs> uh, 
Asa manam chizin yundan kunji ji, ma chizin yundan yung ji rang chizin yundan chizun khande ji yana ko jian chizin la ten jong ade ase. Rang ki po yin da sem ki ki po yin da li ki de po yin da ya mi dang tun po yin da ya cham yin ji khande ten de ya chizin ji ni jian la chamba gomba la ten na su ganga ki kapo ji jian la ya taktu ma ji wa de su ya jira ki ya su su kupa ji ki ya re jian la ya zopo gomba la ten na su ya nyota yung ki ma chaz na ten de ki ya ya chen de de Tiga samlo ya ya po tane kare chun le tas semgi ji de luki dewa kanga ja chun ji le dene yonggi yo pete hago wa chun ya tik te ya ja jian che ba zong wa te ti cha wa re te go tap chun na so gi kone ya ti chun ji ke ya gi ya tap chun na ngwa re zang go na min da chun lewa lo nyong te tang po toi ba ji dene gom ja dene gom ja ro re. Ambo gaji to ba mung bu tsaa to ji ji ri mo ji par du ju lu tam ji tende de to ba ji ji wakai kwa su su da ma la ya to tende tam ma nyin za gu ni nyam zi lang zi du de ya ji na tende ki bu yung gi ya re zi. So in the uh, practices of exchange of self with others, the first you know meditation is thinking about the fault of self cherishing thought. Now we move to the next one, the benefit of a uh, uh, cherishing others thought. And so this is what I wanted to mention. We don't have a very much time. And so as Penchin Lotan Chirkin mentioned in the Guru Yoga text, that the cherishing other is the source of all the wonderful and amazing amazement. Uh, that's the text said. Why? Because when you really start cherishing others, you already got rid of your angers. When you're cherishing others, you generate more compassion and loving kindness in your mind. So you're much more kind of uh, at peace and feeling this warm and wonderful. Um, and then when you really start practicing the uh, cherishing others, then you would engage in the practices of a patient, generosity, meditation, and so on. And as a result, you will gain all these uh, wonderful qualities of the boomies, the different stage of your practices. And if you think, in this life, when you enjoy wealth, uh, when you uh, enjoy um, you know, beauty, and uh, a lot of kind of uh, fortunate opportunities, these are all the result of your previous cherishing others uh, deed. None of the good things that you're enjoying now come from self-cherishing thought, but rather from cherishing other thought. So you have to remember that, and when you continue to engage, in the practice of cherishing others, you will bring more goodness and opportunities. Um, if we look in a very kind of simple uh, analysis here, uh, when we all have this uh, cherishing others thought, mm, world peace is possible because you care about other people. Uh, when we uh, take care of others and uh, uh, cherishing others, mm, you can bring kind of a, a genuine peace uh, to yourself and to your friends um, uh, through kind of uh, practicing loving kindness and compassion. And you know, that's really bring that amazing patience and understanding toward other sentient beings. As a result, you bring more friends, a genuine friend to yourself. You see, so that's how you know, the cherishing others would work. And a lot of the, our problems and the troubles with the relationship with other sentient beings are actually created by the self-cherishing thought. But if you change that and practice cherishing others, this will really um, eradicate our negative um, emotions and uh, communications to other sentient beings. Um, when you engage in the practice of compassion, you bring genuine kind of loving kindness reflecting from others toward you. So you're the one who really um, getting this uh, amazing um, experiences and uh, therefore you really should you know like use uh, different ways of various approach to generate this uh, cherishing others uh, thought and uh, to do that you first hear, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's advice was first you hear and study you hear teachings you study and then uh, you really uh, analyze the teachings uh, contemplate meditate and then finally, you really implement these teachings in your daily life. And this is how you really bring the change in your daily practices. 
So um, we wonder why we practice cherishing others' thoughts, and why do we care and cherish others? Um, so in the uh, sutras and teaching, it advises us that we really resort many different approach. We use um, many approach, many teachings, many, many reasons to generate this genuine um, cherishing others thought. And why should we do that? This is because if you really kind of uh, think, if you're in a sober, in your sub soberity, I think about what belongs to you, uh, what you gain, what you attain. None of this is impossible without others. We you know, say, oh, my body, right? But if you really think carefully, this body is, is a product of your parents. It's, you didn't really produce this wonderful body, but your parents kind of a product. It doesn't belong to you. And then through the kindness of your parents, it nurtures your body initially as a child, right? Childhood and all that. And that's also done by your parents or by other sentient beings. And uh, you talk about your knowledge and the realization, especially in the Dharma world. You talk about your Dharma practices and your Dharma realization, progress, and so on. And these are also only possible through relying on other teachers, other friends, teaching, advice, and so on. Again, really, all the wonderful attainments that you uh, have is the, due to the kindness of others. And these are really bare facts. We're not trying to create some kind of uh, imaginary <laughs> benefit. And if we talk about uh, um, uh, liberation, if we talk about enlightenment, it's only possible through the kindness of sentient beings and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And why? Because uh, through uh, practicing you know, uh, true collections, the uh, collections of the wisdom and the merits, you only can practice merit through um, working with the sentient beings. So through their kindness, you're able to generate the collections and so on. 
And um, when you talk about uh, um, overcoming your afflictions and uh, practicing patience, you really do practice your patience with the other sentient beings. Without the sentient beings being there, you cannot achieve any of this progress that we talk in the Dharma world. And so by thinking this kind of very soberly and realistically, you really kind of reason yourself that how important it is to other sentient beings in your Dharma practices, or all the wonderful kind of the worldly wonderful and enjoyment that you uh, gain. By thinking that, then you genuinely try to develop self, uh, the cher cherishing others. And uh, that's also the reason why we have to cherish others. Because what you enjoy at best, what you really possess, what you attain, is entirely depends on their kindness. Okay. I then I come on to go to two years in Marai. And that didn't have the year of that. Again, my shit in ten tins on dinner, lunches in Gish, because I can go go to Mana Samba Jazz, Zing, and then go to Mana Samba to the Gachim member. I tell it that that didn't I have has a day. Yes, so um, we have been talking about the uh, recognizing your uh, all sentient beings as your mother, remembering their kindness, uh, generating um, you know loving kindness and compassion, and then we also talked about the importance of uh, um, overcoming self-cherishing thought, uh, importance of generating. Um, the cherishing others. Um, so before we go to the next meditation, which, which is the actual uh, the giving and the taking practices, I wanted to have a few minutes if you have any questions. If you don't have any questions, we'll move to the next subject. Is, it, is another translation for self Just thought? Just two, two. Selfish yeah, selfish, yeah. Same. yeah. Same. Let, me, let me give you the mic. Uh, Rinpoche, you begin with uh, the treating all sentient beings as your mother or recognizing them as your mother. Um, and I've encountered this often in Western audiences as um, a nightmare. <laughs> People think the whole world is my mother. And if you haven't had such a good experience with your mother, you know, it seems like the first invitation there is to be cast into the hell realm. Um, there's a poet, Philip Larkin, who began a poem with these words. He said, your mom and dad, they fuck you up. It's not that they mean to, it's what was done to them. Right? And so he goes on in the poem to recommend that the, the best you can manage is not to have children. Um, fortunately, not a, po a lot of people follow that advice. But it would seem to me that what the poem leaves out is the idea that's presented here of um, uh, recognizing the afflictions that you actually share with your parents. So, you know, you and your parents and everybody else were all in the same boat. And that the way out is essentially what you've described. Um, but I wonder how you would... Uh, how you would approach that first reaction in a lot of people of, uh, my mother? Mm. Yes. And <laughs> 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 Pamaria, Puglia, so Duma, would enjoy into the matter, Simja Tamjolo, Ranga Pamaris, and the Seminal Leonetti, Charcaguiris, Seminal Chartumaris, Caras and Pamaga Sedilia, Dubutania, Manguiola. The Indusama Sama Cadiz Dangres, Consolian Indicates Gilres. Pama could be put the Dizigo, 
Tapi Ya Tapi <coughs> Samlo um, yes, um, I understand uh, this kind of uh, problem that uh, we go through. Um, but as, as a Buddhist, uh, we really have to rely on kind of a, a valid um, understanding. And um, if you really kind of relax, sit back, and with a much broad mind, and if you think very carefully, and there are a lot of things you can say good things about your mother too. And the very reason, if we really think logically, the very reason that you are able to analyze all these problems and troubles with your parents, it kind of doesn't you give you a hint that the mother or the parent didn't been as nasty as we initially thought. If they're really, you know, like a um, loveless parent, they could have easily got rid of you. They could have killed you, they could have, you know, do abortion, or they become so careless that you have a lot of physical problems. So the very reason that you go through certain education and they realized how wrong your parents were, ah, actually that kind of, if you really think, it's very difficult to do, but if you really look impartially, you know, um, if you look mostly unbiased kind of wi uh, wisdom, you can see that they're not as bad as we sometimes imagine. 
I'm trying to help you. So that's how you look at one point. If you look that way, then a lot of things also come out of that kind of uh, meditation. Um, another thing, uh, as a Buddhist, I'm talking being a Buddhist, um, we believe in cause and effect. And uh, we do not kind of blame 100% of the uh, misfortunes that we go through on others. We also take responsibility that I have as much kind of uh, my share as others. And so one of the concepts with that is uh, that when I experience these misfortunes, I must have also done something, if not this life, in my previous life, to experience you know, meeting such, such misfortune family. I also take some responsibility in that as a Buddhist. So by taking this responsibility also, you kind of take away the heavy blame on others. And that really helps you to bring a good solution. If you blame on others 100%, that leaves you have no responsibility. As a result, you would not think of any remedies. But if you really wanted to really end this misfortune, you practice loving kindness, or practice compassion and so on, and cultivating the right seed so that you will enjoy a better life. That's one, another way of uh, Using a valid reasoning. <laughs> Lawashi as you think about the kindness of your mother, <coughs> and think about the nine months that she carries you. Um, if she really is a careless and a loveless mother, um, you know, why should you carry you all this like nine months? She could have easily got rid of you, as I suggested. Um, you know, bearing a child for nine months is a you know, significant commitment and uh, responsibility. Um, if a friend of you asks you to carry his children on your neck for like nine hours, and it's a really heck of a you know, like burden physically and emotionally, but then she's carrying you for nine months. In those times, she didn't kind of mistreat you, at least because you come out as healthy and uh, thinking clearly. It says like how much you know, she took care of you. I mean, you can use all these good reasons as much as negative thoughts that you have toward um, the ascension beings. And um, when you were a child, or when we were a child, and the mother constantly needs to watch at you. Because sometimes, you know, a few minutes of a kind of a careless, the child can end up in a kind of most kind of horrendous accident. And we all so far grow quite healthy and you know thinking rationally you know, they have really did their kind of Jew I think in some ways so that's also another way of uh, contemplating the kindness of other sentient beings and then and another reason that I also mentioned before is now as a practitioner as a Buddhist practitioner and the Buddha you know uh, mentioned uh, I mentioned earlier that the Buddhas do not blame the person who did the wrong thing. But he really looked beyond that mistake and look at the affliction. And if you use that same logic toward you know, our mothers, instead of getting angry at the, you know, the misdeed of the, you know, your parents, but look beyond that, say, what kind of pain she's going through, what kind of confusion she's gone through, and analyzing how she ended up in that kind of status, that may help you, maybe kind of, for that, you need more understanding. You really have to be broad-minded. And that will really help you to understand why and how she did what she did. And um, 
And through that kind of uh, meditation also helps you to heal your anger because then you truly understand why uh, the mother. Um, Rinpoche said, uh, if you sometimes looking at a simple fact, maybe she has been mistreated by your parent, by your father, maybe she was you know, mistreated by, she might have gone through her Jew from her parents. So there's a lot of reasons that the person did why, the, why and they did it. You look at the, your parents' relationship to her parents, see how she was you know, brought up. There are a lot of reasons, and it's not, you shouldn't think as an independent agent, but rather there are a lot of conditions and other factors that force us to act in a way. And we have to look at all this through our meditation. And then finally, although the, your parents mistreated you, but if you really practice compassion, and the loving kindness, the inner you know, reasons that we talked before, it would help you to improve your um, healing. It will help you really to heal and also show love to her. Ultimately, it would also improve your relationship with your parents as well. So there are a number of ways we can do that. And we shouldn't just, you know, like uh, being too narrow-minded, but to try to be as broad mind as possible and uh, contemplate all this issue. And this may be more helpful. <laughs> okay, so we only have a, a few minutes, so we will talk about the giving and the taking uh, practices. The Dongli. the リギメデワ、セムギメデワ、スキボメバヨナ、サ、ダミダマンボニョタマンボジャディニョタマンガヤ、オナポ、ラ。オナポカダテ、タジギ、タジャロナジ。オナポヤ、ナンバリアツツジ
the kindness of your mother, because that has become the root of many other practices. You really have to transform and generate compassion to your mother through using the logic, because that becomes the root practice of many others to come. But for these purposes, uh, first we take, and then we give. So take and give practices, don't we? And then what you do in these practices, first you um, visualize your mother or someone who you really wanted to work with. And then uh, through their kind of right uh, nose, uh, you are taking uh, a black kind of uh, a smoke coming out as if uh, the suffering of that person is coming out in form of a black smoke. And then you are inhaling that. And as you are doing that, the sufferings, the misfortunes and um, illness and of all the uh, things is coming out and you are taking it to yourself. And uh, by that you are cleansing that person's all misfortunes and illness so on. And then And then as you, because for a lot of people, you really struggle with that practices. As you kind of inhale, the you know, uh, smoke, that is like a negative uh, experience, thought, and misfortune of that you know, person, your mother or someone you beloved. Or, and then you inhale that, and that kind of black smoke goes directly to your self-cherishing mind. We have this strong I or me, my, that really kind of, there's a solid you know, feeling there. And uh, when you, as you take the sufferings of that person, and that kind of directly attacks to your self-cherishing thought. And, this, and then you also imagine the self-cherishing thought and the self-grasping thought of that person is also coming out. And you are able to remove that from that person. At the same time, by taking this, it's also attacking your self-cherishing thought as well. So the benefit of that practice is it's really destroying both the yours and other self-cherishing thought. So that's the kind of uh, attacking and when you to do that, the uh, preliminary the, uh, practice is a strong compassion. First, you really generate a very powerful compassion to that person. And then think, I wanted to remove all the suffering of that person. And you're removing it. And then mm, you give. And with the you know, giving, uh, you really have to rely on your loving kindness mind. You generate this very strong loving kindness. And this is going in form of a white, pure kind of a smoke going into that person. And it's a cleansing and a healing and uh, making that person wonderful practices. So why we first take and then give later? You really wanted to help someone. First, you have to remove their problem. And then, you know, help them to address the correct uh, remedy. If you wanted to uh, fill a pot, with a you know, meal, nourishing food. First you have to clean the pot, right? Then you offer the, uh, substances. Likewise, first you remove the negative, maybe negative, you know, like a, a vibrant forces of that person, taking this to yourself. Then you're giving your practice of the loving kindness, giving your loving kindness back and uh, healing that person. So that's the practice we do. No? And when you uh, take, uh, you take the, you know, like a, a negative karma, misfortune. No and of the uh, person, uh, illness. And when you give, because you first generate this loving kindness, and then you're giving your loving, your uh, the, uh, fortune, your uh, merits, 
uh, all the wonderful, your wonderful attainment and so on, you're giving this back to your mother. And so through that kind of visualization, you imagine that person has been healed or you know, eliminated all the negative forces and uh, sustained with all uh, virtues and the positive fortune and so on. So that's how we practice it. Uh, I was saying, can we maybe do a few sessions together? Yeah. Uh, you, then you no time. This is the middle. So you create this posture, please. So you, you visualize your mother or someone you wanted to deal with in front of you. Then you generate a great compassion to that person with the intention to remove all the sufferings of that person. And then you really inhale uh, this uh, smoke coming out of the uh, nose of the person and it goes through your nose and uh, removing all the self-cherishing thought, the misfortune, negative deed, affliction, and so on of that person. And uh, that again, in turn comes back to you and it goes, absorbs into your self-cherishing thought mind. And then you uh, visualize, you imagine that the person or person's misfortune, all the suffering has been dispelled, removed, cleansed. And then once you removed all the uh, sufferings of the person, now you generate a very strong loving kindness first. With this loving kindness, you give um, your fortunes, wealth, uh, all the wonderful attainment uh, to that person through a form of a pure white uh, smoke or cloud. And by that kind of light going into the persons, uh, you visualize the person is filled with fortunes, um, good fortunes, uh, collections, attendance, uh, happiness, and blissful, and so on. And then you get this very kind of a pleasant thinking, now I'm able to remove all the sufferings of the person, I'm able to replace it with the happiness and bliss and so on. And then you get this joyfulness for engaging in these practices.
Yan barba ve cidder kembadan kundur zambu deyang dijin de dada kunci cizun dağlı bizim gevade dağıtım ya Rabdu'un o tuzun içi ben gevatem çekeyim o vakanla çoğdan kabul. We are rejoicing our marriages, dedicating our marriages to the full enlightenment of all the sentient beings. that they eventually attain full enlightenment. In my watch, I still have one minute. <laughs> we apologize for the, you know, a little bit of a delay. Yeah, thank you.